good morning. Welcome to church. Anybody happy to be in the house of God this morning? You know, we are glad you're here. So good to see you. We welcome you and, and those who are online. We have a special guest this morning, kind of found out last minute. Pastor Barbara is with us. Would you go ahead and stand, please, Pastor Barbara? I... Uh, I, I tell you, we, we owe so much to our founding pastors. Um, I was just thinking about it as I was standing there. We were able to give about $150,000 to missions last year. And, and part of that's because you are an incredibly generous church. But you know what the other part of it is? We had founding pastors that had a vision to pay this facility off. So we have no mortgage. We have no debt, which means we could put a lot of our funds towards kingdom purposes and that is owed to the Bonacorsis, and so, so very thankful for you, and so glad you joined us this morning. How many of you have heard about what's going on in Kentucky? Okay, Bill and Judy. Okay, uh, apparently Kira has heard as well. All right, there is revival that has broke out. My understanding is I haven't got a lot of information, but it's at a college campus in uh, Kentucky, a Christian college campus, and I guess. It's getting pretty radical pretty quick. There's busloads and busloads of people going there. People are getting saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. And come on, how many of you know God can do that here? And uh, I tell you, if enough of us really believe that, enough of us are really praying for that, what I believe is this move in Kentucky is a first fruits of something God is getting ready to do on a very large scale. Come on, how many of you are excited about the possibilities? Because, man, if we are going to see transformation, it's going to be because it's a move of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be because we preach better sermons or we have better worship music or we improve the quality of the coffee. Uh, and by the way, we've already done that. The coffee's pretty good at this point. But, but really, that's what's going to make the difference. So anyone excited about the big game tonight? I, I don't hear a whole lot of enthusiasm and Seeing how the Bears were dead last in the NFL, it's hard for me to be enthused about the Super Bowl today, but nonetheless, it should be a, a good matchup. And if nothing else, it should be a time where we can kind of just catch our breath and relax. Because how many of you know it's been busy around here? Man, it's been kind of crazy in a good way. But it's been busy. We had the Holy Spirit encounter on, on Monday, so we set up our living room type atmosphere in a circle here and just spent time worshiping and praising God, and it was powerful. We had the prophetic word flowing. It was awesome. And then we finished up our Life of Jesus 40-day devotional on Thursday, and that was so great. We've been getting so many testimonies about people who say that God just ministered to them through that time. They have either developed or redeveloped a love for the Word of God and are getting into it more than ever. i just so delighted to hear those kind of things because that's why we did it. And then Friday, we wrapped it up with the Bama presentation in this room. And I thought, okay, here, ye of little faith, we'll have this section and we'll watch the, the film. And then like that section got filled up real quick and we had to like turn the screen on over here. And, uh, but we had a good time. It was really, really good. And so if you're feeling a little over-programmed right now, um, know a couple of things. No, one thing, we're going to slow down a little bit. Okay, but the word of the Lord would be to you that you're not to slow down. Come on, you're to push in and continue spiritual momentum, continue to grow, continue to seek God. But we're not going to have so much programming. The other thing about the programming and the things that we've been doing is we just don't set it up arbitrarily. We're not trying to just gather a crowd and get people together for the sake of doing that. We only do things that help us to fulfill our mission. We seek to encounter God, experience healing, to walk in freedom and live with purpose. But I was evaluating the past week, and what I thought was really cool is we, we hit the mark on every one. Encounter God. What is that? Holy Spirit encounter. That's what we're here for, right? But it's more than that. You know how many testimonies over the years we've gotten from people who found healing coming to a Holy Spirit encounter? They were prayed for, received healing. And so it helps with that as well. When we're talking about life in Jesus, of course, we're, as we read the words of, of our Savior and study the gospel accounts, yes, you're going to encounter God. But the other thing is you're going to walk in freedom. Come on, how many of you know this book is the only source of absolute truth we have? And you will know the truth, and the truth will what? It will set you free. And then we got to the Bema, and the Bema 
Told you last week we ran it 15 years ago. Pastor John ran the audio in this room. And so we did the video. But what's it about? It's about the judgment seat of Christ. It's about living with purpose. It's about understanding that one day we are going to face God. And this is our opportunity to love well. This is our opportunity to care about people more than ever. And so along those lines, uh, before I even get into the word this morning, I feel like I have a word for somebody, probably many somebodies. Um, I, I've said recently that if we're going to hear from God, and I feel like I've been hearing from God more honestly in the last couple of months than I have in the last couple of years. Any, anybody else, would you, would you say that that's true? God is speaking to you more than usual. I, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of it is, is what he is preparing to do and move in this region. I really believe that. But I said that Man, God is not going to yell over the noise of this world. He speaks, speaks in a still, small voice, and we have to quiet our spirit. The problem is, in a week like this where we've got so much going on, it's positive energy. It's not fear. It's not worry. But there's been some distraction, right? So that makes it harder to hear from God. But what I love about God is, is I serve a Savior that will meet me right where I'm at. And so Friday morning, God knows as soon as my eyes are open, it's Bama, it's it's, we got to preach Sunday, this is going to be great, and I'm going to just be running. I'll spend time in prayer, but really it'll just kind of be reading through the list, because I got stuff to do. And God spoke to me right at that point, wasn't a dream, right at that point, just before you open your eyes, you know you're stretching. (laughs) And right there, he says, I will lift a standard. And I thought, okay, I know the verse, Old Testament, have no idea where it's at. And really, honestly, God, it's one of those verses I really don't understand, but great, you're going to lift a standard. Awesome. And I felt like, no, you got to study it out. So I went to a website, had eight different commentaries. And of course, I Googled the address. You can write this down. This was Friday after we put in notes. Isaiah 59, 19 is where this verse is found. This is what it says. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, sometimes translated a rushing stream or a rushing river. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Come on, the idea is that there is this rushing river and it's overflowing the banks and it's like tsunami-like force that's coming at you. Come on, how many of you feel like that right now? It's just wave after wave after wave. You can barely catch your breath and here comes something else. And what God wants you to know is he's getting ready to raise a standard. And I thought, that's great, but I still don't understand. And so I looked up, what does standard mean? Ensign, E-N-S-I-G-N, still doesn't help me. What's ensign? This is what it is. It's a military flag flown on a ship to indicate nationality. So the idea is when one of America's ships are are out in the ocean, they raise up the ensign, and it's a notice to any potential enemies that if you come against this ship, the entire armed forces will stand against you. I don't think you're, you're, you're getting this. The, the word Lord Almighty means Lord of Angels Armies. Come on, and what God is, is saying is he's getting ready to lift a standard, and the enemy might have come at you in one direction, but he's getting ready to be scattered in seven, okay? But here's the thing, man. God is getting ready to raise a standard, but he is establishing you in the meantime, Sometimes we get through these seasons like, why do I got to go through this stuff in the first place? Because it's only under extreme pressure that we begin to set down roots like a tree. God is looking to raise up pillars in the house of God. Come on, somebody. This is the reason for it. And if you will hold on, listen, you're going to get your victory. God is raising up a standard. We need to pray and and, and kind of get to uh, our Father's business, continue to get to our Father's business this morning. Um, I'm going to be discussing, uh, this is uh, this week that we, we read, it was the end of Jesus's life. And I'm going to be talking about the crucifixion. And uh, as we talked about this as a preaching team and kind of talked about the descriptive language that I will be painting, they thought, you know, probably should give the church some notice in case some young years, it's a little bit too sensitive 
uh, and you might not want them to hear this. So I'm saying that because as we pray, that might be a good time to duck out if you have that concern. But we're going to talk about what Jesus went through. We have this verse as we open up in prayer. I kind of want to use it as our guide um, towards the end of our reading this, this week. Luke 24, 45, and this is the passion, of course. He supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of scriptures. I, I love that. Uh, the literal translation, in case you're wondering, then he opened their minds, referring to Jesus, by the way, then he opened their minds so that they could understand scripture. But, uh, but I liked the, the idea of the passion saying he opened it supernaturally. Come on, come on. How many of you know this is a supernatural book? And if we're going to understand it, then we have to have the mind of Christ. We have to have eyes to see. We have to have ears to hear. And that's where we're going to start this morning as we bow our heads and seek God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Scripture refers to you as the spirit of truth who leads us into all truth. And I ask you to do that. I ask you to open up our eyes so we can see, our ears so we can hear what the Spirit of God is saying this morning. Supernaturally open up our understanding, God, so we can not only understand what you're saying, but give us the strength to apply it to our lives. And God, we ask you to do that for your glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a, a shorter message this week. In fact, I literally cut out 10 pages of this message last night. And I'm like, God, what are you doing to me? And I, I feel like he, he just wants us to make the main thing the main thing. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to save some time for ministry at the end. I titled this message, Selfless Love. And so last week we talked about first things first and, and how the primary thing with God is that we love God, we love others. In fact, he wants us to love others as we love ourselves. And really how we show our love for God is by loving people. In the text, in the Passion said that, listen, everything else is a peripheral issue. And so we studied that through. And this week I want to talk about the selfless love that we see in Jesus because he lived this out better than anyone who's ever walked on planet Earth. And so the cross is the ultimate act of selfless love. But how many of you know Jesus' suffering didn't start at the cross? Jesus' suffering started in the garden. Jesus was under such intense stress, such intense pressure, that he was literally sweating drops of blood, Scripture says. That's a real thing. It's called hematohydrosis. It's where capillaries burst because you're under so much stress, so much pressure. It's a very rare thing, but capillaries burst to where that actually happens, that your sweat gets mixed with blood from the busted capillaries. That's the kind of stress that Jesus is under. And here he is in the garden. He's getting arrested, and Peter whacks off one of the high servants, um, the high priest servants here. And so it's in this condition that amazes me because I got to tell you, at that point, I'm not really worried about what's happening to my enemies. How about you? But, but Jesus was, and he went and healed him. He went and showed that selfless love, even under those conditions. But sweating blood was just the beginning for Jesus. Pat is one of our leaders in our Switch student ministry, and he sent me an article by a Dr. Shear, and it's titled The Science of the Crucifixion. It's really, really lengthy. I'm not going to um, read the whole thing. I'm just going to summarize it the best I can, mostly the best I remember. And so Jesus is, is being arrested. And what you got to understand is that his, his torment started first with a two and a half mile walk from Pilate to Herod and back to Pilate. Now, Jesus was in shape. He walked all over the place. This wouldn't have been a big deal. But you got to understand, he's already been severely beaten, and he's sleep-deprived. He spent an all-nighter in the Garden of Eden. And so it's at this point that Pilate flogs him. Now, now what that means is they took a whip, and this whip had many strands, and, and some of the strands had these giant metal balls on them, really heavy, and the idea was to inflict deep, deep bruising, but it also they were so heavy they can break bones, and Jesus would have been whipped with this. At the tip 
of the whip would have been sheep bone. And the sheep bone was, was, was carved in, in the uh, idea of a claw. And the idea is if used properly, it attaches to the skin, through the skin, into the muscle. And when you pull it back, it rips the muscle back and exposes the bone. So Jesus would have taken this kind of beating. He would have had severe blood loss. We can assume at this point he would have been in shock, but we know for sure he was severely dehydrated. At this point, a, a crown of thorns is put on his head. Years ago, I had someone from the church give me a crown of thorns, and this is from the bush that they really use. And this is not just like, well, it's, it's a thorn and, you, you know, it'll break. This isn't going anywhere. This is solid. And the points of this are sharp as you could be. I can't imagine what it would have been like as they put this on his head and with full force rammed it on as deep as they could go. According to Dr. Shear, that would have caused nerve damage. That would have caused extreme pain in his face and his neck, and it possibly could be the reason that he was so disfigured because that nerve damage would have just dropped his, his muscular tone. He's mocked. They spat in his face. At this point, he's definitely in shock, which is why he couldn't carry his own cross. And this is the condition Jesus was in before going to the cross. When he gets to the cross, the cross would have been laying on the ground, and they would have Lay Jesus down. His back, again, would have been flesh ripped up, muscle hanging. I can't imagine how a rugged cross would have fell on his back, but he doesn't have a lot of time to think about that because they're driving seven to nine inch spikes into his wrist. One of the areas in the body that we have the most nerve endings, it would have been extremely painful. And then they do the same thing through his feet or they think just above his feet. As the cross is, is risen and put into place, the full weight of Jesus is now put on his wrist. At that point, his shoulders would have dislocated, his elbows would have dislocated, to the point that Dr. Shear says his wingspan would have been at least six inches longer than it would normally be. In addition to that, extreme weight is on his diaphragm, which making it hard to breathe. Now, when there's pressure on your diaphragm, the problem's not getting in air, it's getting out air. And so to exhale, Jesus has to push up on his feet, or to talk, Jesus has to push up on his feet. And as he does, as you can imagine, that would be extremely painful with the spike that's been put through his legs. He would have developed several medical conditions. Pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, myocardial infarction for sure, but those are only to name a few. In shock, he would have been shaking violently, which would have tore at his bruised and wounded flesh even more, and he would have been so cold, his teeth would have been chattering. But unlike a person who experiences shock and kind of passes out, Jesus is awake and experiencing every cruel moment of this. The crucifixion was invented by the Persians in the 300s BC, and, and a lot of scientists still believe that man has not created a more cruel way to kill somebody to this day. And so this is what Jesus is experiencing as we pick up the story in Luke 23. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to Luke 23. And what I want you to see is in this terrible condition how he responds to those even who are his enemies. Verse 32 says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. Matthew 27 says specifically they were thieves. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others? Let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. 
But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. How many of you know that that's, that's incredible love? That, that selfless love. That's the agape love that, that is natural to God, but not natural to us. And it's especially incredible when you think that just moments before, this man who is in paradise for all of eternity. Come on, how many of you know it wasn't a weekend visit? He's still there. Just moments before was blaspheming Jesus himself. He said, well, Barry, you just read the story. That's, that's not the case. Well, we're talking about a harmonized gospel where they blend the stories together. And, and this harmonized gospel didn't include this. But, but I want to read it to you from the book of Matthew. This is what it says. And the robbers, or the thieves, who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way, the same way as the religious leaders and the Romans. The word revile means blaspheme or can mean blaspheme. And so what that means is somehow at some point, this guy had a change of heart. He started out reviling Jesus just like the other guy, and at some point, he rebuked the other guy for doing it. And so the question is, why? What happened? As we read the story, the only reasonable conclusion is he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Think about it. He has probably never done a decent thing in his life. He is getting exactly what he deserves. He is bitter. He is angry. And he is lashing out at anyone and everyone who will listen, including Jesus himself. And all of a sudden, this guy who is suffering worse than, than he is because Jesus had been beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. The passion of the Christ is probably the best depiction we have of this. But even in the passion of the Christ, you could tell that it's Jesus. In, in real life, you couldn't. Do you know how badly someone's got to be beaten to you can't even tell who they are? And he sees this guy in this pitiful condition, and it takes so much strength even to speak, and Jesus uses that strength to ask for forgiveness. And this guy must have concluded that's not human. This has to be the Son of God. And he repents. It's incredible. There was a soldier at the foot of the cross. He had heard the same thing. And when Jesus died, he said, surely this was the Son of God. How did he come to the conclusion? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. They're two thieves. They're both in the same predicament, but one went to eternal glory and the other went to eternal damnation. One believed, one didn't. But how many of you know belief in and of itself isn't enough? The Bible says that demons in hell believe, but it won't by any means save them. It wasn't about believing, it was about trusting I wonder if the Roman soldier ever trusted Jesus. We know the one thief did, but I wonder if he did, he will be through with us in all of eternity. I'm coming on 25 years of serving Jesus. March 17, 1998 was the day I came to faith, and so we are a little over a month from my 25-year anniversary. Well, thank you. But this is what I want to tell you. March 17, 1998, I said a prayer to receive Jesus. But here's the thing. I did about two weeks before that. Why do I consider March 17, 1998 my day if two weeks before I, I said the same prayer? Really, the words weren't all that different. Someone led me, and it was really close to the same. And I meant it, mostly. But see, two weeks before, it was still on my terms. Two weeks before, I realized that my lifestyle wasn't going to fly if I wanted to serve Jesus. And I didn't want to give some things up, primarily drinking. 
had a drinking problem. And so uh, from my standpoint, it was like, okay, I said that prayer, but, but Lord, you know, we're going we're gonna to get better. We're, we're going to change some things, but, you know, I'm still going to have a drink here and there. I mean, you know, New Year's Day, Super Bowl Sunday, we're going to have a beer. My birthday, Tuesdays. In other words, I was willing to accept Jesus, but it was on my terms, not on his. Oh, someone needs to hear me this morning. That won't cut it. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord of, at all. And so what happened on March 17th, 1998, I said, listen, th this preacher up here is saying that, man, you want all of my life and you will give me all of your righteousness and, and we'll just clean up the mess later. And so if that's really what you're willing to do, then I'll take that deal. I'm in, count me in 100%. Lord, you could have it all. And 25 years later, I've never changed my mind. It's my life belongs to Jesus Christ. But this is what I know. In, in a room this size, without a question of a doubt, and, and with our online audience, there are people who maybe have heard the gospel message numerous times, and they've never responded to it. Or they've responded to it, and they started off strong, because really, honestly, that's my story. I grew up in the faith. But in March of 1998... Man, I was at a place very, very far from God. And so what happens is we fall away, and maybe that's you, and you're coming back to church, and, and it's time to get right with God. Come on, I want to give somebody the opportunity to do that. March 17th, 1998 was the greatest day of my life, and today can be the greatest day of yours, regardless of who wins the Super Bowl. And so this is what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to do eight altar calls and beg people to come. But what I'm going to do is a little bit different. We're not going to do the every head bowed and every eye closed thing. Because we just read about a half-naked Savior who suffered and was mocked and ridiculed in front of everyone. And he did that out of love for you. And so what we're going to do is a public declaration. And so if that's you and you either never accepted the Lord, or you need to get right with God, and that people aren't even waiting, just come on right up. Come on up. You're straight up on the platform. Let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Again, I'm not doing 10 calls, but but church, if it's, if it's time to take care of business, come on, guys, come on in. Come on, guys, these are your brothers and sisters in Christ as of this day. How you doing? Okay. All right, I wouldn't do this under normal circumstances, and I wouldn't do it to anyone but you, Pastor Barbara. But I don't think you're here on accident. I think you're supposed to be up here with me. And I know the reason I wouldn't do it to anybody else, because this could be intimidating, but I know you well enough to know you're ready in season and out of season. And so I think you're supposed to lead them in prayer and lead them to the Lord. I don't know, have you, any of you prayed this prayer before? You prayed have not meaningfully, but the rest of you have. So I'm just going to lay hands on you and say, Lord, I am here today, and I'm not messing around anymore. Just say that to the Lord. Say, I am here today. Yes, God. I'm not messing around Praise anymore. You, Jesus. I'm here today. I'm here today to give it all to you, Lord. Yes, God. Lord, just touch this yes, beautiful God. woman. Yes, God. Now, Lord. Just come upon her, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Come on, fill her, Lord. Lord. Fill her, Lord. In the name of Jesus, just break her heart. Break his heart for what breaks yours, yes, Lord. Break this gentleman's heart for what breaks yours, Lord. And all of you say, Lord Jesus, just repeat after me. I give you all. I give you my all. I believe that you were crucified, tortured for me more than I can even comprehend. 
beaten, unrecognizable for me. Yes, God. And that you died and rose again. Yes, God. For yes, me. God. Just for me. Just for you. Yep. He died and rose again. Yep. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. All of my life. You're in charge now. Forgive me of my sin. That's it. And help me to walk in a new life. Mm. I trust you and I give my life fully to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, church. Now, when you walk out of here today, it's a new day. New Come day. on. Come on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Why don't the rest of us go ahead and stand? We're getting ready to close the service. I do want to say that any of you who have made that decision today, we would love for you to go to the information desk. We have a Christian Life Bible for you and uh, would just love to talk to you about some next steps. For those of you who are online, there are people you can connect with there as well. I, I want to close like this. I want to pray for the people who are up against it right now. I want to pray for the people who are feeling one wave after another after another. I want to pray that God will just steady you, that your roots will go deep, that you will be established, come on, in the Lord, because he is getting ready to lift the standard. He is getting ready to defend you and to protect you, but he wants to accomplish all that he wants to accomplish before that. And so, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I ask for strength for my brothers and sisters, God. Some people in this room are going through some things that, God, I've never gone through. I don't ever want to go through. But, Lord, I know you are in charge. You don't miss a thing. And, God, you love them infinitely more than anyone on the face of the earth loves them. Even the ones who have mothers, you love them more than that. And, God, I just pray pray right now that you would comfort them. I pray right now you would steady them. I pray, Jesus, you would be that rock. You would be that anchor, that you would keep them solid, God, as they grow into all that you have for them, God, and use them for your mighty purposes. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen. amen.